So Satan is very, very clever. So I'm going to explain to you the tools Satan uses and very clever tricks to make Christians doubt their religion and to make Muslims believe that they are the final answer. So Muslims claim to believe in the prophets of the Bible. Right, so I'm going to show you scripture and refute this religion scripturally. Right? But to, we have to also understand that the responsibility lies with us. Right? Judgment starts with the house of God. Right? So before I go into scripture, I want you to look at this. And it is not in Morocco or Tunisia, in Egypt. This is in Sweden. Muslims, they come into Sweden, and the Swedes say, you know, if you all come here, we already have a God, we already have a religion, we already have a culture, we don't want that religion here, they call you racist, or like in this demonstration, uh, uh, against Islamophobia, all these things, but why do Muslims believe that Christianity is a false religion? Well, one of the major reasons is this. I'm here now to debunk uh, Christianity in less than a minute, and to do so, I'll need my first witness, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, so Jesus teaches in the Gospel of John that the only true God is the Father. Who's that? The only true God is the Father. For those at the back, the only true God is the Father. If the only true God is the Father, then Jesus cannot be God. If Jesus is God, then he's lying. If he's lying, it means he isn't God. Therefore, if Jesus says the Father is the only true God, he isn't God. If he's lying about the Father being the only true God, he isn't God. Therefore, Jesus debunks Christianity in less than a minute. Christians, you're welcome. So this is where the cleverness of Satan comes in. So you have to be grounded in scripture to see the tricks of Satan. Because this guy did not refute scripture. He did not refute Christianity. He refuted a false doctrine. But that does not mean Christianity is false. That just means that false doctrines came into scripture. That's why I'm so zealous to talk. I, I made so many videos exposing the Trinity and the oneness things because of this. And when you go to London, I know this guy. Um, I, I, I've seen him at Speaker's Corner, I've been there multiple times, and all you see Christians trying to convince Muslims about the Trinity. But Muslims are not totally stupid. They can read. And when Jesus said that the Father is the only true God, they understand that because they have not been indoctrinated by our false church pastors. But that does not mean that Christianity as a total is false. The problem with both Christians and Muslims is that they believe that they are in a religion and that you can fight each other about who is right. But we are not in a religion. We are in a covenant God made with us. And we're going to prove it, right? So this guy did not refute anything except that Jesus indeed is not God the Father. I agree with him. But that does not mean that Islam is therefore right. This is the cleverness, right? They think we can refute Christianity by refuting the Trinity. And you cannot do that. You cannot refute a covenant, right? So Muslims believe that Muhammad was the final prophet of Scripture. But that is impossible. And this is also... Uh, the cause of the ignorance of 
the people of the religion of Christianity, that they don't understand it. They even think about it. Could it be true? Maybe it's not true. But if you understand scripture, you'll see that Muhammad cannot be the final prophet. Because all prophets came from the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's nothing about prophet being of Ishmael, right? First of all, this is very important to understand. Because this universal gospel to believe that the gospel is for all peoples of the world, brings Christians in a mindset that as long as they co try to convince these Arabs that they will become Christian and we will all sing Kumbaya, and it will never, ever, ever happen because these people are not of the seed of promise. And let me show you what scripture truly says. So God made a promise to Abraham that from his seed, would come a nation and eventually also a multitude of nations. That does not mean all nations of the world. That means nations who would be guided by God. And that would be established through Christ, the Christian nations based on God's spirit and law through Christ. The European nations fulfilled this promise. So through Abraham's seed, his bloodline, his offspring, would this be established? So God promised Abraham a son through whom this covenant would be established. But Abraham was old and he got impatient. And so he made a son with his bond woman, Hagar, the Egyptian bond woman. And they got a son, right? Abraham got a son from Hagar called Ishmael. So let me read about Ishmael. In chapter 16 of Genesis, we read, And the angel of Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahweh hath heard thy affliction. So they wanted a child, Right? And he got a child, Ishmael. And he will be a wild man. And his hands will be against every man. And every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of God. No, in the presence of all his brethren. So this Ishmael will be a wild man. He will always be fighting. And we see over the last thousands of years that these Sons of Ishmael have been fighting each other, have been fighting others. There has never ever been peace. Even though without any other peoples messing with them, they were already fighting each other, right? Different cults, different sects of, of Arabs fighting each other. And that all happened, was already prophesied that will happen in the descendants of Ishmael. So even though Ishmael was Abraham's son, God was very clear that he would not be that promised seed. Right? I'm going to show you. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Right? But he did not. Right? That was the wish of Abraham, but it did not. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. God promised Abraham that promised seed. And even though Abraham got impatient with Ishmael, that did not make Ishmael the promised seed. So God gave another son to Abraham. And that name was Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with Isaac for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. So it's very clearly written that the promise, the covenant, the dominion, God's presence, all these things would be established through the descendants of Abraham and Isaac, not Ishmael. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. So Muslims use this one single verse to see, see, Ishmael was blessed 
and he will be fruitful and multiply, right? And twelve princes, and he will be a great nation. Yes, but being blessed has nothing to do with a covenant, right? Jesus even blessed uh, the Canaanite woman, even though he said he didn't come for you. The covenant was not through Israel, but because he was Abraham's son, he still was blessed and he would become his own nation and he would do his own thing over there. But it has nothing to do with the covenant because we read on, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at the set time in the next year. So God's promise of his presence, of his guidance, of his laws, of the dominion mandate, all these things would go to the offspring of Isaac. But Ishmael hated Isaac because Isaac was the most beloved son of Abraham. Because through Isaac, the covenant would be established. And in the book of Jesher, we can even see that Ishmael tried to kill Isaac. That's why he was sent away from Abraham. And Ishmael was sent into the wilderness, ended up in the, the peninsula of Arabia. And this is where Ishmael started his people. But he did not worship uh, the, the religion of the Hebrews. They worshipped Arab folklore, probably also a, a form of Babylonian gods and even Canaanite gods. And let me show you how that happened. So the promise went from Abraham to Isaac. Now Isaac had two sons, right? And the seed line had to, to continue. The promise would continue. So these sons were Jacob and Esau. But we know that Esau lost his birthright. And the promise went to Jacob. That's why over and over and over again we see that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Never once do we read that God is the God of Abraham, Ishmael and Esau. Never once. The promise of God went from Abraham, Isaac to Jacob. So Esau was also cut off from the birthright and the dominion mandate. And Esau went south in the peninsula also of Arabia, in the region called Mount Seir, where also Ishmaelites were. So Abraham uh, dwelt in the land of Canaan, there in a circle north, at, and Esau went south to this region called Mount Seir. And the children of Esau would be called the Edomites, the land of Edom, south of what eventually would be called the kingdom of Judah. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Bashemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. These Hittites were considered Canaanite peoples, and God said, don't intermarry with them. You will start worshipping their Gods, but Esau did not care about the birthright. He did not care about righteousness. He did not care about the promised seed continuing all these things. And Esau went to Can the land. He started to marry Canaanites, Hittites, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and Rebekah. So uh, Esau grieved his parents by marrying these other peoples who worshipped other gods. So when Esau saw that Isaac, the father of Jacob and Esau, had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Badam Aram to take him a wife from there, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan, which Esau did. And then Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Badan Aram. And Esau, seeing that not daughters of Canaan pleased Isaac, his father, right? He knew he messed, messed up. So he tried to make up 
So Esau went to Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abram's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. So Esau went to the daughters of Ishmael and intermarried with them as well. But Esau, uh, even marrying the daughters of Ishmael, Ishmael was already cut off. The covenant was not going to be made with Ishmael. So Esau lost his birthright. The promise to Abraham would go from Abraham, Isaac to Jacob. Both Ishmael and Esau were no longer part of the God's guidance and the covenant. So Esau married all kinds of other peoples, lost his birthright, and he even eventually would become the enemy of God's kingdom. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom, the Edomites, the enemies of God's kingdom. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, so not just one. He, he took multiple wives of Canaan. Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zebion, the Hivite, so uh, Hittites, Hivites, all Canaanites, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth, and Ara bear to Esau Eliphaz, and Basemath bear Ruel, and Aholibama bear Jews, and Yalam and Korah, these are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. And Esau took his wives, and his sons, and his daughters, and all the persons of his house, and his cattle, and all his beasts, and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan, and went into the country from the face of his brothers Jacob. And their riches were more than they might dwell together, and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus Esau in Mount Seir. So Esau is Edom. So the sons of Esau became their own people called the Edomites, and yet also the Ishmaelites. But these bloodlines were already intermixed with each other, even though Ishmaelites and Edom are still called separately, the, you can see that the bloodlines already intermixed with each other. And Jacob, who is of the promised seed, had 12 sons who would become the 12 patriarchs, right? Who would become the fathers of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob was renamed Israel later, right? And we know that Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob. And the other brothers didn't like that. They tried to get rid of him, kill him. They threw him in a pit. Right? So Ishmaelites and people bought it, took him out of the pit. And they thought it was a good idea to bring him to Egypt to sell him there as a slave. But Joseph became the most powerful uh, man in Egypt under the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh gave all authority to um, Joseph. And the other brothers eventually caught up with him. We can read all about it. It's all the scripture, right? So this is where the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob lived prosperously in the most beautiful region of Egypt. But eventually they would become enslaved, right? And Moses took them out of Egypt in the authority of God and they brought them back into the land of Canaan and they would establish the kingdom of Israel. But they also started a war and now it was divided. You had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah in the land of Canaan. But Edom, the sons of Esau, were still uh, the that kingdom was still there, even in the time of Judah. You can see it here on the map. Kingdom of Judah and south, the kingdom of Edom. And the Bible tells us that the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away. Um, they were deported by the Assyrians because of the, their idolatry. 
they also started to worship Canaanite gods, and God divorced them. The Assyrians even took tribes out of the kingdom of Judah. Right? So there was not much left, but also Judah was warned. And we know that Babylon took over the whole region. And the kingdom of Edom became part of the Babylonian Empire. They even helped the Babylonians take away the ones in Jerusalem, the true Israelites, and take them captive into Babylon. And now the kingdom of Edom, those Edomites, moved northwards and started also living in the kingdom of Judah. But we know that the Persians overtook Babylon and took the Israelites out of Babylon back into the kingdom of Judah. But by, by, the, by that time, the kingdom of Judah was already filled with Canaanites, Edomites, Babylonians, all kinds of different peoples. So Islam claims that it all started in Mecca, but more and more archaeologists and historians uh, refute that idea because Mecca is a very relatively new city, right? The whole trading, the whole the Nabataeans, the Edomites, the Ishmaelites, they all focused around the city where Islam started, and that was not uh, that was not Mecca, but that was Petra. And where is Petra? Petra is in the kingdom of Edom. But don't be deceived. Persia may have overtaken uh, the kingdom of Babylon, the empire of Babylon, but these royal bloodlines from Babylon, the Nabataeans, they lived all in Mount Zir. And it was all about money and deceit. They did not care about God's kingdom. But don't forget, the promise was still eternal, made for Jacob, the tribes who came back to Judah, and there were not many of them, but the promise was still made to them alone. These Edomites and these, all these royalty of those enemies could have lived in the kingdom of Judah, but that does not make them true Judahites or Benjamites. So in the second century before Christ came, they thought it was a good idea to just convert those Edomites into Judaism, into their religion. It wasn't even called Judaism back then, right? It was the, the Hebrew faith. So they circumcised the Edomites and tried to bring them in. But it did not take long before the Edomites, to their money and to their wealth, to their bloodlines, to control over Judah. Even installed a king called Herod, who was an Edomite. And, of course, the northern kingdom of Israel was lost, scattered. They went away into the nations, right? So when Jesus came to save the sheep, those were the sheep of Israel, right? Not any, not, he did not come to save Ishmaelites and Edomites and Babylonians. He came for his sheep, and my sheep hear my voice. So even King Herod, the Edomites, the Ishmaelites, who were powerful with money, with all those old bloodlines, right? They controlled the silk routes, everything. It did not matter because it was not about money. It was about building God's kingdom. And in 70 AD, God destroyed the whole place by means of the Romans. So the true Israelites left the building, they left that country, and they were united with the lost tribes who were already north in Europe. I made many videos to explain how that happened. And the Romans took control over the whole place, the Roman Empire. And that includes Edom and the Middle East, North Africa, Egypt, um, all the way into Europe. That was all Roman territory, and they became eventually Catholic, right? But the Catholic faith 
was also infiltrated by these Edomites. And by the way, because the Edomites could not enter the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, they started to call themselves Jews. Why did they call themselves Jews? Because they used to live in Judah. So they said, we are Judeans. But it was only by geography. They were not Israelites. And living in the kingdom of Judah does not make you a Judean spiritually. It was only by geography. So the Edomites started to call themselves Jews. And they moved all through the Roman Empire into Arabia. There were Jewish settlements in Arabia, right? Uh, cities like uh, Medina, right? I think that is called after the Midianites. Uh, that, that's what I think. But the Jews also went north into Spain and all through the Roman Empire, into the Gazar, into into uh, modern-day Turkey, right, to Constantinople. Um, so they moved all around, but they were not part of God's kingdom, right? Because the new covenant, these were not called Jews, right? They would become the true Christians. So this whole Roman Empire made a state religion, the Catholic Church, right? So it was all Catholic, even there, and I circled it in the old land of Judah, where the Christians, the true Christians, already were long gone, right? So you had in this region, also in the circle, uh, it's Edom, right? Where the Ishmaelites lived, and the Edomites lived, and the Jews lived. Basically all the same people, they're all related to each other. But there were many conversos, some who converted to the Catholic Church. And the Muslim sources even tell us that the first wife of Muhammad was a Catholic nun. Now, that does not mean that she was a white nun from the city of Rome. No, she was a converso, but she was probably a Jewish converso. And even Muhammad himself probably had a mixture with Edomite Jewish blood himself. But this religion of Islam came hundreds of years later, right? They wanted to control. So these Jews and Muslims are related. It was the Jews, the Edomites, who came up with this new religion. 